Welcome to Musings of a Super Doer with host Christina Kendall. Over the next hour, you will learn what keeps Christina and her guests busy with all their day-to-day life tasks. Now, here's Christina. Hey there, welcome to Musings of a Super Doer. I'm your host and resident super doer, Chris Kendall. I'm so glad you're joining us today. Um, In this episode, and really all episodes, I'm going to be sharing some random musings about what's going on in my life and my world, and maybe some things that you can relate to in your world too. Today, we're going to talk about picky eaters and my experience as one. I'll also share some random musings about sectional sofas, and, um, and then we'll discuss some options for you if you'd like to create a course that um, you teach people about your passion or expertise. And if we have some time, I might talk about some of my shows that I'm watching right now. Okay, so let's get started. Um, For as far back as I can remember, I've been a picky eater. Uh, When I was really little, I think it was probably just a, you know, a symptom of being stubborn, wanting to get my way, testing. Um, I My mom was really young when she had me. And then two and a half years later, she had my brother. And so I think I just wanted attention and, and you know, was being difficult. Um, but as I got a little bit older, like six, seven, eight, you know, and beyond, um, I really did have this very... Um, a particular palette where I could taste everything that I didn't like. <laughs> so any flavor, if it was in there that, and it wasn't one of, you know, on my approved list of a very short approved list, I just could not eat it. I would gag. I'd make myself throw up. I would, you know, it was, it was a terrible thing to witness, I'm sure. Um, and so as I got older, I started to force myself to eat, you know, more food. Um, I, I, I think I had my first salad when I was probably 18 or 19 years old. And that was mostly because I was dieting and all of my friends who were thin were eating salads. And I knew that if I wanted to be thin or get thin or stay thin, I needed to eat salads too. So I forced myself to eat a salad. However, I don't like dressing. And so instead of, you know, training myself to eat dressing, which is the unhealthy part of a salad, right? I just didn't ever eat dressing. So I still eat salads today. And there are many salads that I really love. No dressing, dry. So when I go into a restaurant and I order a chicken Caesar, dry. And so basically it's a bed of romaine lettuce, some slices of grilled chicken and um, Parmesan cheese, maybe a couple of croutons thrown in there, but that is my perfect salad, right? Um, So I have evolved in my eating, but I've tried very carefully to not include all of the the unhealthy pieces of things. So for example, um, salad dressing, but also like, um, I do not love lettuce. So I'll eat a, I'll eat salad with lettuce, obviously, but I will not eat a burger with lettuce on it. Okay. I don't want a, I want a plain cheeseburger. So the bread, the meat, the cheese, if we're lucky, maybe some bacon, but that's it. No other condiments at all. And no lettuce, even though I'll eat lettuce in the salad, I will, I don't want it in my burger um, unless it's a lettuce wrap. (laughs) So I will eat a, you know, patty with cheese or, and, or bacon if I'm doing keto or Atkins or something. And a lettuce wrap, you know, wrapped in lettuce, then I can eat lettuce with the burger, but I can eat lettuce in like just a regular cheeseburger. And if I go to like McDonald's where they have like that shredded lettuce, that's, you know, really skinny. And there is a one slice, one speck of lettuce in my plain cheeseburger. I mean, not only do I have to spit out the entire bite, I have to usually like break off half the burger, which is, they're not very big, right? Right throw it away because the entire thing has been contaminated. I mean, it's this whole thing and it makes no sense. It's all in my head. And I know that that's true. And I just go with it. I mean, there was probably a time in maybe my thirties when I wanted to like break free of these shackles of picky eating. And um, now I don't even care. I'm fine with it. If I just eat bagels and plain pasta and white rice 
and French fries for the rest of my life. I'm okay with that. Um, my scale, <laughs> my doctor will not be okay with that, but I don't feel like I need as much variety as I once did. However, it was really important to me when I started having kids that they not be picky eaters. Like that was an absolute a non-negotiable. They will eat everything because not only was it embarrassing for me, I always had this very strong sense of like being polite. Um, and when I'm a guest at somebody's house, I want to always be polite and respectful and everything. And I absolutely dreaded ever eating over at a friend's house because whatever they put in front of me, I'd feel this obligation to eat, right? To be polite. But sometimes like I literally couldn't stomach it. And I throwing up at the tables more, you know, rude and offensive than saying no, thank you. But it was a super stressful time, um, you know, through like my adolescent years and teen years. As I, you know, got older, it was, I was more confident to say, oh, thank you. But no, where I just started telling people I was allergic to things that I didn't like so that they would drop it and I could move on and just eat plain lettuce in a corner without anyone thinking it was a big deal. Um, if that's what it came down to. But with my kids, that was a non-negotiable. They were required to eat everything. Um, so they, from the, you know, as, as early as they were able to start eating solid foods, we had them eating sushi, um, very strong flavors, um, very extreme, like spicy, not too hot that they would, you know, be in pain, but like spicy enough that there was a strong flavor. and. Um, and they ate ketchup and mustard and, you know, mayo and all the things that I don't eat and never plan to eat. Um, they, you know, were introduced to those things early. And I, I every now and then I'll run into people who, um, you know, they don't like something like, let's say they don't like ranch dressing or ketchup or something like that. And, um, and you know, we'll be having a conversation and they'll say like, well, I don't have it in my house because I don't like it. And that's fine. I mean, for, for unhealthy things, ranch dressing, that's not exactly something people need to like. Uh, maybe a better example is like um, fish. Fish is generally pretty healthy. If you are um, in a location where you can have access to either fresh fi fish or frozen fish or canned fish, I guess, um, that is you know, responsibly harvest and it's safe. It's not like going to be from your local pond and full of mercury or contaminants or something like that. But in general, fish is very safe and it's um, an important protein and it's important pro um, source of fats, you know, fatty acids and that kind of thing. Um, and so it's important, I think, for people to eat fish unless they have some sort of allergy to it. Um, but there are, there are adults that I know friends that I have who don't like fish. Therefore they don't, they don't let their kids eat it, or they don't ask their kids to eat it or offer it to their kids. Right. I mean, kids eat what their parents give them. Um, and so if their parents say like, well, I don't eat it, so I don't want my kids to eat it, or I don't think they should. I mean, I just feel like that's irresponsible and, um, you know, just very selfish, uh, you know, it, it's, it's one thing to say, I don't like something. And so you try it. And if you don't like it, that's okay. Um, which is not the route I went that it was not okay. They, they were required to like things, but if other people want to be more lenient and more uh, flexible, that that's fine. Um, but to, to automatically bias your kids against certain foods or trying certain experiences, just because you don't like them, like maybe you're afraid of heights, therefore you never let your kids climb on a, a ladder or go at the top, go to the top of a jungle gym. I mean, it's just uh, a little bit ridiculous. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the things that I've experienced um, with my kids is when we go out to, you know, we've traveled to lots of different countries and experienced lots of different cultures and different foods, and it's wonderful. And um, usually they all are looking at me like, okay, take your first bite. What do you think of it? <clears throat> and now as a, you know, full, full, full adult, I will taste everything and try to keep a polite smile on my face, no matter how bad in my mind it tastes to me. Um, but, you know, they're always really encouraging to like, okay, well, you taste it. 
um, if you don't like it, I'll eat it or me and me and my brother will share it or whatever, because they know that I don't ever want to be rude and leave a plate full of food when I'm served it, especially in a different country or, um, you know, at somebody's house. But um, there are just certain things now that I cannot stomach. Um, <laughs> an example is recent, this was several years ago, I had a very unfortunate situation. Um, I was home and one of my sons and I think his girlfriend at the time, they were here and I, or maybe I was alone, I don't remember. Um, I was drinking from a fast food cup. Like I, I went to a fast food restaurant. I had a cup of Diet Coke or something like that with a straw. I got it. I shouldn't even tell the story. I'm already feeling it coming back up. Um, <laughs> so I took a drink and it was like at the very end, you know, like it's just the ice that's left. It was sort of like the last drink before I threw it away. Um, something came up. So I, t I take a slurp with a straw and in my mouth, I realize it's an onion. Like there is a piece of onion that was in my drink that has been like, you know, was down. Oh God. <laughs> I shouldn't be telling this story. <sighs> deep breaths, deep breaths. <laughs> um, came up. And as soon as I recognized that in my mouth, I mean, not only that it was a foreign object, it could have been, a, you know, a chocolate chip. And I would have still probably had the same reaction um, just because it was something that it shouldn't, someplace it should not have been. But um, yeah, I like immediately ran to the sink, emptied out everything. Um, and it took me like a year before I could drink, uh, anything from a straw, from an unknown, you know, source where somebody had handed it to me. And still to this day, like if I go to Chipotle or someplace like that, where they hand me a cup and I fill it up myself, I mean, I always like check the cup and make sure it's clean, get the ice, a little bit of ice, look at it, make sure there's no foreign objects in there. Uh, get my drink. It, you know, it's this whole process because I, I, my palate is super, um, like, I don't know, it, it's not, not sophisticated, obviously, in any kind of way, but it's very um, trained to seek out the flavors that I have told myself I don't like. And what's funny is like, I like onion flavor, like onion powder, in theory, like, or sour cream and onion potato chips. I like, I don't eat sour cream and I don't eat onions. Um, I don't really like barbecue sauce, but I love like barbecue chips. I think I'm just a junk food person. Apparently that's really where it's all coming down to. But, um, you know, I, I like cherry flavor, like cherry candies or, you know, cherry ice cream or soda or something like that. I mean, I like the flavor of cherry, the artificial flavor of cherry. I don't eat real cherries. I like fake blueberry flavor. I do not eat blueberries. Um, so it's really just this uh, psychological thing where there's certain, it's probably texture too, that there's certain things that I just don't like. Also, I find most fruits and berries to be very bitter. Like I don't eat strawberries because every strawberry I've ever put in my mouth has been really like bitter and not sweet and delicious, like strawberry candy, you know, <laughs> strawberry cake. That's what I like the flavor of, but I don't like actual strawberries because they don't taste very good. Um, or I haven't had the right ones apparently because other people have told me they're sweet and delicious and I have not ever experienced that. So, um, but the point is <laughs> just because um, I am a picky eater, I really uh, don't ever encourage anyone around me to allow themselves if they can get past certain things they should I, it really broadens your your world if you can enjoy foods from other cultures and from anywhere if you're you know show up at someone's house unexpected and they insist on feeding you if you can get through a meal i mean that's a much more pleasant experience for everyone than if you're you know constantly trying to find reasons not to to eat it um or you know come across as rude or offensive um and if you have kids please do not let them be picky just because you are, or even if you're not, I mean, maybe you eat everything and your kids are picky. And so you tell yourself like, oh, they're just kids. Kids don't like flavor. Kids don't like spicy. Kids don't like this or that, that kids don't eat shellfish or, you know, more kind of exotic flavors. Again, as long as there isn't an actual allergy, I would encourage you to um, introduce and strongly 
recommend, strongly encourage your kids to try everything enough that they kind of get used to it. You know how there's some things that like, you don't really like the flavor, but after you eat enough of it, you're sort of like numb to it. It doesn't really bother you anymore. And maybe eventually you come to really like it. This is what happened to me with um, miso soup. The first time I tasted miso soup, it was like, it tastes like Band-Aids. Like that's all I could think of. And of course, everyone says, well, how do you know what Band-Aids taste like? Well, as a kid, I used to always have like paper cuts and I'd always have Band-Aids on my finger and inevitably my finger would end up in my mouth and I'd be like kind of chewing on that Band-Aid or like at least having it in my mouth in some way. I know what Band-Aids taste like and miso soup is pretty much what Band-Aids taste like. But I kept eating it because um, it would always come with, you know, my chicken teriyaki and it's, you know, salty. I like salty. So I would eat it now. I love it. You know, I, I eventually got past that aversion that I kept telling myself it tastes like band-aids. I moved on and I really like it. And I think that's true for most foods that we aren't familiar with. Even if right off the bat, we don't love it. If we keep eating it, we can either tolerate it or eventually learn to enjoy it, associate it with you know, good memories or good experiences or things like that. So um, with your kids, it's the same thing. As long as you tell them it's good and it's healthy and it'll make them strong and it'll make them run fast or whatever you need to tell them um, or that they can go visit grandma or cousins or, a, you know, a place, a special place that they want to go, but they need to be able to um, need to be open to eating the food that's served there. Um you know, you will be helping them, um, really setting them up for success, social success in their life, because I don't understand it. But when I, again, not as much now, but like in my twenties and thirties, I would go to a restaurant with like colleagues or work people or people that didn't know me super well. And we would order and I would, you know, kind of discreetly say to the waiter, like, can I get this item, but can you hold it, hold the onions or can I get this, but plain without the, you know, whatever kind of sauce that's normally put on it. And everybody would look at me as if I was somehow ruining their meal. Like, well, why don't you just try it? Why don't you just eat, you know, like they would make such a big deal about me ordering something different. And it really was annoying to me because it's like, you know, don't worry about me. You eat what you're going to eat. I'm going to eat what I'm going to eat. I, I'm not going to you know, damage your meal in any way. And, um, but it, it really does bother people when not everybody, but it really does bother some people when you don't just do what they're doing and just eat the way they're eating or drink what they're drinking. Just like, you know, as adults, you've probably experienced if you're with a group of people that is everyone's drinking and you don't want to drink or everyone's not drinking and you want to drink when you're doing the, the thing that's different it can be very awkward for you, but also for them, like they, then they feel like you're judging them in some way or that you're making, um, you're trying to set yourself up as special or different. And, and certainly with being a picky food eater, it's not so much like that they think you're trying to be special, but it's kind of embarrassing um, to not just be grown up enough to eat anything that's put in front of me. And um, it's definitely an insecurity and I wish, you know, the way it, my childhood was, I don't think there was an option for my mom to like insist that I eat certain things. I would have just been, I, I just wouldn't have done it. I, I was that kid that I would have just starved at the, it sat in that chair for 17 hours and passed out there because I would refuse to eat, you know, broccoli or something like that. Um, so in my situation, you know, I can't, honestly say I wish my mom would have done it differently. But um, as a parent, I definitely from day one was committed to doing it differently and making sure that, um, you know, my kids were exposed to all flavors and never had the opportunity to be picky. Now, of course, there are some things they don't like, and that's fine. Like if they eat everything, except there's this one flavor that they just really do not want, fine. Everyone's allowed to not like everything. That's okay. But you know, just kind of doing it, saying in your head, looking at something and saying, no, I already don't like it just by looking at it. That's not okay. Um, and it's certainly not a healthy long-term lifestyle for anybody. Um, so I hope that for those people who 
are dealing with picky eaters when they're young, don't just chalk it up to kids being kids. As with everything, as the parent, it's our responsibility to um, expose them to other things and to make sure that they they grow up with all the advantages. And trust me, being able to walk into any food kitchen and eat something is a huge advantage. When the apocalypse comes, I'm going to probably be the one who doesn't make it because there's only going to be you know, options for non-picky eaters and all of my delicious, you know, the Twinkies will be gone first. And so then I'll just have to starve to death. So I do not wish that upon anybody else. Um, so that that's my random using on um, picky eating. Yeah, how, how that came about, I don't even know. But we're going to go ahead and take a quick break. So grab a snack of any kind. Um, Check your stocks, do what you need to do. And when we come back, we're going to be talking about sectional sofas, of all things. Okay. Back to the show. Hi there. Um, I am Chris Kendall, host of Musings of a Super Doer. Uh, before the break, we were talking about picky eaters and um, how unfortunate that is to be one. Uh, but now I want to talk to you about um, sectional sofas. Kind of random, as most things that we talk about here are. Um, but something I've been thinking a lot about lately. Um, so we have in in you know, in my house, we have a family room that's pretty much where we spend most of our time is probably the same in your house as well. And so about four, well, it was a good two years before COVID. So it's now been about five years. I started looking into sectionals. Um, I really wanted one of these modular sectional love sacks um, from the company Love Sack, a sectional, um, these sac sectional, um, no modular sectional from love sack okay so i really wanted one of these because you could con configure it in any um layout that worked in your space and so i had this whole plan of how big it was going to be i measured everything out etc they are so ridiculously expensive like i wanted leather because we have animals and i have a lot of allergies to my animals but they're always you know in my lap and in my face um so leather is really the best option um to keep like to minimize the hair that's in my eyeballs. Um, so it, it was like, when I priced it out, it was like $18,000 for this sofa that I wanted. So I the, like, there's no way I'm going to do that. Um, so I started looking into all these other options. It's actually really hard to find a sectional that fits exactly the way you want it. And it's so frustrating because they all come in this like standard L like um you know three cushions on the left three cushions on the side or you know right and side and and that's that's pretty much it now you can find that anywhere you could probably walk into a Walmart and buy one of those um certainly at Costco or or Wayfair or any of the online stores and you could get them for cheap like maybe three four hundred bucks up to maybe a thousand two thousand something like that um but it it wasn't the right fit like I needed something slightly bigger and then I wanted a certain color and I had all these these um limitations so I finally ordered one from Pottery Barn it was also very expensive not as expensive as the sectional but um I was super excited like this is going to be the most expensive piece of furniture I've ever owned and I couldn't wait to you know get it in um there's like a a really long wait period when you order one of these, it's like six months or something. So by the time I finally placed my order, it was just before COVID happened. I placed my order and then, um, you know, waiting, 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 and then COVID and nothing was being shipped, nothing was being built. So then it was like six more months. Finally, they deliver it and it's missing a piece. It's a sectional, but it's supposed to have, you know, the two sides and the middle piece that connects it, right? The middle piece was not there. And after having it for about 24 hours, we realized it was just too delicate. Like it was that, that kind of leather that like, if you scratch it with a fingernail, it's ruined. Like that scratch is there for life and any sort of like, it was super delicate. So like, there was no way that was going to last in my house anyway. So we returned that searched all over, finally bought something, um, at Macy's 
ordered it, waited months to get it. And then um, it was the wrong size. It was not what I ordered. I needed a two on one side and three down the other. They sent me a two and a two, which is the same cheap everyday model that I could have walked into Walmart to buy. Like it was, it, it, and it didn't fit in my space, but I've had it. For, <laughs> so we used it for a little bit, but I was so mad and it didn't fit. And so I returned it. Okay. I shipped it back. I, we just went and bought like some patio furniture and put it in my living room for the time being till I could figure out what I wanted. After like three or six months of that, I got and mad again, I went to the Macy's clearance center and I rebought the same sofa that I had returned. Fortunately, it was much cheaper. So, you know, okay, whatever. I got it back. We've had that for the last two years, but it's, it's miserable. It's too small. It doesn't fit. I hate it. Like, ah. so finally, I think I'm back to the dumb love sack sectional. <laughs> <laughs> that is super expensive, but it's like, I've obsessed about it for five years. I should have just bought it then and been happy. And so I went and, and um, went to the store, the showroom, because their website's terrible. You try to like configure things. It doesn't work at all. So I went to the store and they have these little blocks. So you can um, put all these blocks out and sort of rearrange them as if they were the actual pieces of furniture. So you have a seat and a back and a side and you know the ottomans whatever so you can kind of arrange exactly how it's going to lay out and i think what i finally um landed on is that i'm going to have a couple um like a sort of a standard two seats on one side and that's where my husband and i usually sit and then on the other side where it's going to have three big cushions I'm going to divide those up into, I think they call them like theater seating where you have an armrest. So it's going to look a little bit funny, but I think it's going to be the, the most functional way of using it. Because the thing about sectionals, in theory, you can fit a ton of people on them, right? Like if you, if you stack people next to each other, next to each other, all the way around, you could probably fit, you know, eight people on a sectional. And if you were watching, um, you know, a Tupperware presentation and everyone was just sitting straight in their spot eight people would probably be, be pretty comfortable but the way people really live in the evening when they're watching tv and they're having a snack and they're cuddled with the dog and a blanket and all that stuff they stretch out and so the bad thing about sectionals is nobody has like defined space so you one person stretch out stretches out in one direction then another person stretches out in the other direction and then there's a book on this side and pretty soon your big old sectional that can seat eight really has room for like three people to fit without being in each other's space, right? So even if I go a little bit bigger, I'm realizing maybe I can fit one more person on it in a jam. Like if, if we feel like we have to scrunch together, but for the most part, the way we sit comfortably, people, they, they create their own space and it's much bigger than one seat, you know, like one cushion. When you look at a couch, if there's three cushions, you think like three people can sit there, right? But if two people are sitting there with, you know, some stuff around them, then that big couch really is perfect for two people. So I think that by, um, I think the reason I have to go with the love sack is because by putting in these armrests between three cushions and making three distinct seats, there will be, there'll never be a reason for someone to look in that section and say like, oh, well, I don't want to sit too close to that other person, or I don't want to encroach on their space because it's three separate seats. It's like having three separate chairs. And so I will definitely always have room for three people there. Then next to it will be where I sit. And then the dog is usually kind of in between us and then where my husband sits. So I think I can squeeze out of this ridiculously expensive sectional that's going to take up my whole family room, five, <laughs> five people. There will be some space in between um, on the other side that if one of my kids wants to sit next to us or like, an, you know, a, a cousin or niece or somebody that wants to come and sort of scrunch up with us or cuddle with us, there's room for a sixth person. But I think realistically, the most I'm ever going to get out of this is going to be the five. But I'm happy with that because right now it basically fits three people and that it just doesn't work. 
and I mean, there are some, there are some sectionals that are giant, right? You've probably seen these ones that fit like 12 or 15 people. I mean, they just like wrap around an entire room. We don't have that kind of space. The way our, our house is lined up, it's, um, this room is sort of long and we're facing the one wall. So if we go too wide, then there's not room for people to comfortably move in the space. Um, and then this is my chair that I sit in, which is basically my office. And so this can't go anywhere. I have to keep this exactly where it's at. So, um, yeah, if you're looking at sectionals, it's it's a whole process and it's a it's not as easy as it sounds and it's it's not as easy as it should be. I mean, you would think that just plugging in a big seat that will fit, you know, six or eight or 10 people is the end of it but that's just not how people live on a regular basis when you've got little kids that are you know kind of cuddled up with you that's easy um there's no issue with personal space because they don't give you personal space they're just like on top of your lap or hanging on your side or whatever but when it's like adults and you've got guests we have some house guests coming in um a couple well about a month and a half and um I'm really stressing about like, where's everyone going to sit in the evening when we're just talking because there literally is not enough room right now. Uh, and that's what I'm hoping this love sack is going to help us with. So um, if you're, if you've been looking for sectionals, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. If you haven't been really take the time to consider where people are going to be and how much open space is going to be around them and sort of this bubble, this invisible bubble that people create in a sectional of like their territory that other people shouldn't encroach on. And you might not get as much extra seating as you would think. And in some cases, it probably is going to be make more sense to have individual seats or maybe love seats, several love seats, where you know that there's two at a time in a love seat um, in order to get maximum people comfortably seated seated in that space so i know totally random totally crazy but uh one of the things that i i worry about in my life um okay so that was quick we'll take another quick break right here so you can grab a blanket and get cozy um and then when we come back i'm going to be talking about creating a course so this is um is probably something that if you haven't thought of it yet, by the end of this conversation, you might be thinking about doing it. So I hope that um, I hope that I can get you started in that direction. I'll talk to you in a minute. Welcome back to Musings of a Super Doer with your host, Christina Kendall. Have a question for Christina or her guests? Join us on the show at 866-472-5788. That's 866-472-5788. Now, back to the show. Hey, friends. If you're just joining us, I'm Chris Kendall, host of Musings of a Superdoer. Before the break, we were talking first about picky eaters, and then I went into some ramblings about sectional sofas. <laughs> now I want to share um, some musings about creating a course. Now, this is kind of a random thing, um, as most of my topics are. <clears throat> I created my first course um, right in the midst of COVID, like right when COVID happened, I had been thinking about doing it. I um, had some extra time, right? All my trips and all of my fun stuff had been canceled. So I decided to go ahead and start building a course. Um, and so I, in the past couple of years, I've learned everything there is to know about it and, and how to do this successfully. So I just wanted to share this information with you in case there's something that you might be able to um, educate people about. So is there like a passion or something that you just really enjoy doing? Now, I'm not talking about like you have to have gone to college for some special skill or anything like that, but just things you like. Maybe you like um, canning canning vegetables or making jams or um, doing diamond painting or some sort of a craft, or maybe you're just really good about, you're good at like... Um, rebuilding engines in cars or um taking apart uh 
plumbing, you know, like the under the sink part of a plumbing, if there's a clog or if there's something stuck in there, like whatever it is, you've probably seen all these short YouTubes about how to do little stuff, right? So if there's um, a bigger project, something that is can't be explained in like a seven minute YouTube video, maybe it's more like a seven hour, um, like seminar that you could give. Creating an online course is actually a really um, great way to not only share your expertise, um, get some new clients, if this is a, like a side hustle or a business for you, or maybe it's like your primary business. Maybe it's like a serious, you know, you run a company that has a certain offering. Um, it's a great way to drum up business by proving your expertise, but it's also a um, uh, a really interesting way for people to make money if they have, um, if they just are doing it as sort of a side gig. So um, what I, whenever I'm talking to people about possibly creating a course, I ask them to think about what, um, what skill do you have that you would like to share with others? What are you really good about um, teaching people talking about? What could you you know, if you had a whiteboard and a couple hours, what could you spend some time just getting into the weeds about? Um, and then, you know, are you an expert? Are you one of the, you know, the best people in your world, whether it's a big or small um, area of influence uh, that can, sh can offer this advice to people? Um, so, actually doing the coursework is easy. The way I did it is I used Google um, Slides. I didn't use PowerPoint. I have PowerPoint and key, Keynotes or is that what it's called? Key, I think, whatever. The um, the stuff that comes on Apple. Um, but I just used Google Slides. <clears throat> I created kind of a, a front page of like um, what, you, you know, what the course is about. For me, the course is about self-publishing, publishing a book. Um, and how, you know, all the steps that are involved. And it was probably, I think it's about a 12 hour total course. It's like 15 units and they all go through the different st stages. Now that probably sounds really intimidating. Like how can I come up with 15 hours of content or, but it doesn't have to be, it could be two hours of content. I mean, if I told you that I could teach you something you've been wanting to learn or something that you're really interested in, in two hours, would you do it? You know, that's probably a lot easier than you trying to find like a college course or um, trying to, you know, find an expert or a consultant or somebody who would want to meet with you, but their first appointment's in three weeks, and then it's only on Tuesdays at four o'clock, but you're not available at four o'clock, you know, like uh, these online courses that are evergreen. So they call it evergreen if it's always uh, available. So it's not like, it starts on this day and then it expires on this day and then you've missed it if you didn't watch it during that time. Evergreen means that anybody can start it anytime. They can watch it at two o'clock in the morning, go through it, and and it's still as useful as if they watched it, you know, the day that it was recorded four years ago. Right. Now, obviously, sometimes these have to be updated. Um and the technology changes, the information changes slightly. So if you create an evergreen course, that doesn't mean you never have to touch it again. It might mean that you are going to go in once every six months or once a year and sort of provide uh, updates or new information or you used to do it this way, but now they've made it even easier and we just do it this way or whatever, whatever your situation is. But um, if you just sort of lay out, going through all the steps one by one and what people need to do. Now, if you're going to teach them a start to finish project, whatever that is, like I said, for me, it was publishing a book, but for you, it could be um, designing a new house or if they want to, let's say somebody wants to do a remodel, what are all the pieces necessary? It, they have to first start by talking to an architect or a designer. So they have, there's permitting processes. There's um, picking out materials, picking out, all the stuff going through, you know, there's a lot of steps involved. I don't even know. Um, so whatever, whatever that is, that's what you would know, right? You would be the one teaching me how to do it. So um, laying out all the steps of what you plan to teach in this particular course, the more information you give people, the better, obviously, the more comprehensive it is, the more likely they're going to spend more money. Um, if it's something that is, uh, you know, a 30 minute course, they might not want to spend more than 1999 for it or some some nominal amount 
If it's a seven hour course, they might be willing to spend a thousand dollars on it or more, five thousand dollars on it, you know, depending on what they're learning and what the alternative is. If this is information that really only you have or you're, a, you know, within a small group of people who have this information, um, that means you can make a lot of money from it. You could sell, you could put the price tag pretty high. If it's something that everybody knows how to do or any average, you know, handyman can do it or every, any average literature teacher or PE instructor or something like that, well, then you might not be able to, to get quite a premium price tag unless yours is just that much easier to understand, that much easier to access. You've got a personality that people would rather watch than others. Um, there's lots of factors. Uh, so, you know, lay out um, in Google Slides what you are trying to teach people and then create different slides with um, big bullets and, and not like it, this isn't for you to read to them, like put in big bullets of like maybe five to 10 words on a, with a couple different bullets and then you explain it, right? So they might see the screen and see those bullet points and everything. But when you're talking to them, it's going to be the, the real details. Um, and then just go through all the pieces. Now there's a tons of software. So once you have your slides, um, that's great. You could monetize that. You could put that um, on YouTube as a restricted video for free. <clears throat> you get it up there and then you make it restricted and then you advertise or you make it available to people. Maybe you're in um, some associations or, or clubs related to this topic. If you're not, you could join some and then, you know, tell people that you're offering this course that teaches them about this thing and um, they could pay you directly. They could just Venmo you or PayPal you or something like that, whatever amount you're charging. Once you have their email address, then you go into YouTube and you give access to that email address as a restricted account. And that's the only person that can log in and watch it. So that's fairly low tech um, and fairly uh, low cost, right? That doesn't really cost you anything to create that kind of um, an experience. If you want to automate it a little more, if this is something that you think hundreds or thousands or more people would be buying from you, you don't want to be manually talking to them, giving them your Venmo, waiting for the payment, doing the whole email thing. That's just too much work. You want to automate it. So there's tons of tools out there that will do this for you. Um, I put my course on Heights platform, H-E-I-G-H-T-S, Heights platform. And it was pretty easy to set up. I mean, literally I just chapter one or course one, class one, whatever you want to call it. Um, I uploaded the PowerPoint. I put in any additional information. If there were links to other like resources or downloadable things that I wanted them to see, I added those and that was course one. And then I just repeated that for each, um, section of the class. So imagine if you were taking a class at like a junior college, community college, and it was an eight week course and it was one hour at a time. Um, that's sort of the way I built mine, but you can set yours up however you'd like to. Um, so that's one one way of doing it. With Hype's platform, I was able to either collect the money directly and then send them to Heights to watch it, or I could send them to Heights and they would pay through that platform and then the money would come to me. Um, before Heights platform, I was using a, a company called Teachable. You've, um, if you've taken any online courses, there's a good chance you've taken a class on Teachable. It's also really easy. It's a little bit more expensive on a monthly basis, but if you are making some money, then you know that's that might not be an issue. Um, but I, there's this pro, um, software provider, I guess they're sort of a reseller called AppSumo, A P P S U M O, and they do these lifetime deals. And they um, curate interesting software that is, um, you know, has a, a, you know, kind of a unique twist to it. And they work with that company to offer a lifetime deal. So that's how I got Heights platform actually was through AppSumo. And I think I probably paid like, you know, a couple hundred dollars for lifetime access. So I'm not paying monthly, um, but there's other, but there's, Every day that you go into AppSumo, you could probably do a search on course, C-O-U-R-S-E, course, um, 
creator or course host um, and, or course platform, and you'll be able to find several different options um, of companies that this is all they do. They host your course for you. They make it available to your users. They um, will usually do the payment processing for you. Um, they might have the option where you can take the money separate and then send people there. But honestly, I would say the easiest way and the most seamless way is to let them take the money as long as there's not like um, really high service fees. Like if your course is $1,000, and you have to pay 3% of, of that money to the course company, then that's going to start to add up. Um, but you know, you can, you can decide how you want to do it and you can always change it. So you can put your, your um, course, your files first on something like ClickFunnels or Teachable or YouTube. And then after it starts to grow, or if it doesn't quite grow, or maybe it's got a big, um, you get a ton of interest right at the beginning. And then in six months, that interest starts to die down and you don't really need as robust of a platform. You could downgrade too. So it's not just about having to go, it's having to pick something and being there forever. Um, I was using ClickFunnels for a little while. And ClickFunnels is a great tool for it's a great tool. It's just super expensive. It's like $300 a month. Um, and if you aren't making that much, or if you just aren't making enough to justify that percentage going to the tool, especially when you know that there are these other tools out there that are lifetime deals or that you can, um, kind of make last, it, you know, make work for you in a different way, especially when you're just getting started. You know, I wouldn't necessarily recommend ClickFunnels, but uh, but it is an option too, and it's it's definitely one of the bigger known companies that they they do everything. They're just it's a lot of money. It's a pretty big commitment because then they try to upsell you on a million other things, which are amazing and great and wonderful, but it's going to cost you. Um, so uh, once you you know kind of build out your your slides, build out a video of you talking through them upload them to your platform, whichever platform you go with. It's just a matter of telling people that this course exists and giving them a link to subscribe. So like I said, it, they just have to pay you in some way. There are also other um, tools like Skillshare where, um, and there's a couple others that I can't think of off the top of my head, but um, they host many courses for all kinds of different companies and they collect the money and they're sort of like a, an online university. And so people can show up there, they look through all the available courses and yours could be one of them. And then when they choose your course amongst others, um, they pay that company or they have a subscription or whatever. And then you get paid based on the number of people who have selected your course and have, you know, watched it or gone through it. So there really is a, a pretty, um, amazing opportunity for people with any kind of strong passion about something that they love talking about, that they love teaching to other people, um, or just that they're really good at, even if they don't love it, if they're really good at something, you know, they can build a course and they can, you know, possibly make some pretty significant side income from doing that. Um, so I hope that if you have any expertise or passion that you're willing to share, you consider doing that. Okay. So now I'd like to talk about some of the shows that I've been watching. There's a few that are pretty fun and that, um, uh, you know, I, I wish I could get your immediate feedback, but, um, there's a show called special forces and it is people who are uh, like everyday people uh, right now. They're, um, this episode is on, or this current season is celebrities. I don't know if it'll always be like that, but they have these lesser known celebrities doing, um, the kind of training that special forces military people have, have done. And in the most recent episode that I saw, um, the, they had to jump from a moving boat into the ocean, swim to a buoy, and then pull themselves up on a rope to a helicopter that's hovering above them. Oh my God. It was the craziest thing. Like I don't have upper body strength. There's no way I could have even probably reached that first knot and, and absolutely not the second knot. Um, so it was, it was really interesting to watch some of these really strong guys that I assumed would have that upper body strength 
didn't make it. The women, unfortunately, didn't make it either because again, you know, that sort of pulling um, arm, those those muscles are not usually developed as well in women unless they are actual bodybuilders or unless they specifically are doing exercises to build up that that upper body strength. Um, and and then you have to be not too heavy, right? Because your arms have to carry your entire body. And oh my gosh, it's crazy. So if you're if you like gladiator type of shows or where people are really pushing their body to like these extreme limits, um, that's an interesting one to to check out. Another one um, that my son and I started watching is called Physical One Hundred. It's based out of Korea and it's a, like a game show, I guess. Um, and we we started watching it because it was it, sort of like reminiscent of Squid Games. Um, and I think the people, the contestants, they didn't really know what they were signing up for. They have all, um, they're all like extremely um, extreme specimens of the human body and they are extreme athletes or military sergeants or they all have these just like amazingly built strong healthy bodies and um, that's just really interesting you know the dubbing into English is always a little bit funny I think because the the kind of reactions I know when they do literal translations of like oh wow oh wow oh wow that's probably what some people are saying, but if you were to listen to a group of people in English saying like, oh, wow, you know, it would, it sounds a little bit different than when they, when they do that kind of um, translation into English, it's a little bit funny. So it's entertaining. If you like watching really physical, like fighting, almost fighting type of shows um, and you enjoy um these, these sort of like competitions, I definitely would recommend checking out Physical 100. Um, okay, so I think we are just about at the end of today's episode. I always feel like I don't know what to talk about and then I just babble on for so long that it it's at the end. So um, we've now run out of time, but I'm so glad you were able to hang out with me today. I'm looking forward to sharing more random things with you that I've been doing on our next episode. Until then, I hope I've inspired you to be a super doer. So goodbye from your host and resident super doer, Chris Kendall. And now you should go do something. Thanks for tuning into Musings of a Super Doer with Christina Kendall. We hope you've enjoyed today's show and look forward to having you back next week. Until then, have a beautiful week.